Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. I want to focus in this session on this topic. And that is rediscovering the priority of law for kingdom living. Joe, I will see you tomorrow. Rediscovering what? Priority of what? Law for kingdom living. Our session today is focusing on rediscovering the priority of law for kingdom living. I want to begin with what I believe will be the key to living in this 21st century. 2010 has ushered us into a very difficult period. Matter of fact, on Christmas Day of 2009 was another reminder that we are not safe with the terrorist threat that took place. We began the new year standing on lines at the airport, being searched double. But to make it through this year, the key to life in this season, in this year and 2011 and 2012 and beyond, is we have to get back to rediscovering and return to the priority and the power of divine law. I cannot stress how serious this is to us. Make a note of this. The key to overcoming chaos, which is what the world is in right now, is a return to law and order. Two words that should never be separated. Law and order are two sides of the same coin. And the third point I want to begin with is laws and principles will deliver you and protect you from chaos and confusion and ignorance. When you have a clear understanding of laws, there'll be no confusion. Laws cancel experimentation. When you know the laws of something, the principles by which it functions, you don't need to guess about life. So laws give you confidence. They give you clarity. They give you deep conviction, and most of all, they give you boldness. When you know the laws of something, you become courageous. So this is why our mandate for 2010 is kingdom laws for kingdom living. To live in a country, you must learn, understand, and obey the laws of that country. This is why you are called a law-abiding citizen. Which means that if you're going to live in the kingdom of God, which is a country, you have to learn, 
obey and submit to the laws of the kingdom of God. You cannot live in one country as a citizen and obey the laws of another country. Hmm. I think this is probably clearly seen even in one country alone, like the United States. Everybody say United States. The word state means country. So Florida is a country. California is a country. Nebraska is a country. Georgia is a country. Texas, obviously, they think they are a country. This is why it's called a confederation. These are all separate countries that decided to become a United States, plural, called America. America is a conglomeration of countries. And this is why they are discussing recently Europe becoming the same thing. They're calling it the European Common Communion or Community. They're trying to create the United States of Europe, which is still not successful yet. Now, there are laws in California that only apply to California. Those same laws may not apply in Minnesota. So there are certain things you can do in California that you cannot do in Georgia. Did you know that? This is why certain states, for example, pass laws for same-sex marriage, and other states says, not here. So if you go to that state, you cannot be married as the same sex. In other words, you cannot live in one state and try to obey the laws of another state. When you come into the kingdom of God, there are a lot of kingdoms around. Including the one you used to live in. It is called the kingdom of darkness. When you come into the kingdom of God, the country of God, you must throw off the laws that you were living under and you must come under the laws of the kingdom of heaven. So you cannot live in the kingdom of God and claim to be his citizen and then disobey his laws and try to live according to other standards. This is why this mandate is so important. God is saying, if you want my lifestyle, my promises, my commitments, my benefits, you have to obey my law. Here's a scripture I want you to remember and write this down because our entire desire is to become a community of heaven on earth. That's what Christ intended. The original purpose of God was to extend his kingdom to earth by establishing a community of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Adam was supposed to be the first citizen and his offspring was supposed to fill the earth, multiply and fill the earth until the whole earth became just like heaven. They were supposed to live according to the culture, laws of heaven. Genesis chapter 28 was our root scripture for the last 12 months. I want to read it again because this is really the purpose for this theme this year. Please read it with me. Genesis chapter 28 verse 34. Read. May God Almighty bless you and make you a fruitful blessing and increase your numbers until you become a community. So what is God's goal for calling his people out? To create a community. 
Now, a couple of things to write down about community. Number one, community is a product of law. Say that with me. Community is a product of law. Do you know why this is so important? Because without law, there can be no community. Number two, community is submission and a commitment to a common set of laws and principles. That's what makes a group of people a community. It's not having the same color of skin or the same height or wearing uniforms. That doesn't make you a community. What makes a community in any country or any situation is they all submit to and adhere to and they commit themselves to follow the same laws and principles. If you think about it, you can actually use terms like the nursing community. Why? Because nursing is a profession with common laws. You can call it the legal community, lawyers. Why? Because all lawyers must adhere to common set of laws, ethics, and behavior. In other words, wherever there's a set of laws that everybody agree to obey, they automatically produce a community. God says, I want to make you a community. A community is not just a lot of people together. A community is built from law. So, let me give you an example. Everybody say the community. Exodus chapter 12. It's a verse you probably haven't read before. Verse 19. Read with me. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in your house. Who's God talking to? The community of Israel. He says, and whoever eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community. In other words, this is a law for the community, and if anyone violates it, you put them out. When you disobey law, you don't just cancel your connection to the thing you did. You actually disconnect from the whole community, God says. Which means obedience keeps you not only in connection with God, but also to a community. Look at that. If you violate the yeast, he says, you don't just cut off relationship with me, but you also lose contact. A right to be a part of the community. Can you answer me a very difficult question? Why do we put people in jail? <laughs> I can't hear you. Why? Simple. They just break the law. When you put a person in prison, what have you done? You have removed them from the community. See, the only way to get in jail is you got to work with law. You got to do something to the law. So what keeps you out of jail is also the law. Law is so powerful, it can protect you from isolation. Here's another verse you probably never read before, Numbers chapter 19, verse 20. Can you read it with me out loud? Read. But if a person who is unclean does not purify himself, he must be cut off from the community. Take a deep breath. Wow. Whenever you are doing something that violates the law of a country, including heaven, you are dangering yourself from being cut off. Again, please notice, he didn't say, if other people purify you. You purify yourself. In essence, if you want to keep benefiting from the country's promises in the Constitution, you've got to keep on keeping the law. 
and no one keeps the law for anybody. Have you noticed? You cannot tell somebody, uh, stop stealing for me. Or tell the truth for me. It's always yourself. You are totally responsible for the law. Keeping the law. Now, I want to show you another verse that I think this one is the most difficult one. You'll never forget this one. Please turn it in your Bible, underline it. I want you to preach from this, those who are preachers. Numbers chapter 15. Some of you never saw this before in the Bible. Young people, underline it, please. This is a very critical one. Numbers chapter 15, verse 14. God is giving legal instructions to Moses. He said, look, I want to build a, a royal priesthood and a holy nation. I'm going to build it with law. Then God says this in Numbers chapter 15, verse 14. Read it loud. Go. The community is to have the same rules for you and for the alien living among you. Stop last. Stop reading. Stop, stop, stop reading. Okay, let's start there. He said, look, first of all, if anyone moves into your country, they can bring their laws with them. What they think we should do in our country. You all understand how deep this is? That is happening now. People are coming into country saying, look, why don't you change the laws of your country to suit me? You know, my Muslim friends have an interesting uh, philosophy that, you know, you should make room for them when they come to your country and adjust your laws to suit them. Let's read this again. It says what? The community is to have the same rules for you and the alien. That means if someone comes in and they are not legal immigrants or if they join you as an alien they must submit to the same laws you come into the body of Christ you submit yourself to Jesus Christ you make him your king and lord you become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven you don't bring your stuff with you that means if you used to fornicate before you became a kingdom citizen you got to tell your girlfriend and your boyfriend, that's it. I just left that country. Amen. Don't get quiet, please. See, silence makes me nervous. I start looking around. In other words, you can't tell God, look, I, I can serve you, but I can obey them. You are not an alien. And this is why, you know, I hate to think like this thing, but I, I grew up in the Bahamas where I saw people going to communion in certain churches and I know their lives. And they're kneeling down with incest and I know them. I know who their two sweethearts are and they keep going to that place kneeling. Anybody with me by myself? And I'm, I, listen, in Baintown we know everybody. And I'm watching them, and that's, that almost made me turn away from God. I said, wait a minute. Yeah. They, they have no respect for that table. They take their sweetheart to the Holy Communion in their hearts. You cannot bring your laws into God's country. Now the next statement gets worse. Are you ready? Read it loud. This is a lasting ordinance. That means you don't say, well, it's modern now. Let's change it. You know, well, you know God didn't know that there was a she-male. So that old scripture you're reading from Genesis, that old man, you're talking about he made male and female. We made a new one called a she-male. We give a man some hormones, his breasts grow. And we ain't know what to call him, so we call him she male. That's hormones, man. That ain't no she male. You ain't got no womb. What makes a woman a woman is a womb, not bloated chest. But you see, 
We want to change it because we say, well, it's modern time. Let me tell you something. When God told Moses 6,000 years ago, thou shalt not steal, that is still true. Laws that are divine don't change. Laws that men make, you can change them by vote. But not the laws of God. Recently when there was a gay bishop being debated to be ordained, I was carefully following the story. Do you know how he got ratified? 70 bishops in robes got in a room in a conference and they ignored the Bible and voted. And that's how this gentleman became ordained. They ignored the Bible and shifted into democracy and voted against God's law. They fired God and they ordained the man. Since then, of course, we had a female lesbian who is now a bishop. We got, you know, another one coming online a couple of weeks. You know, all this. Once you open the floodgates, law of God is forever. Adultery is still wrong. Law. Now, the next statement. Read it loud. You and the alien shall be the same before God. Lord, have mercy. Because look, when you come to my kingdom, I don't care if you're white or black, short or fat, yellow or thin, pink or blue, handsome or ugly, you under the same law. God's kingdom doesn't adjust to you. You adjust to it. What's wrong with our world is we have become humanist in the church. What is a humanist? Humanism is when man becomes the measure of his own law. He becomes the source of what is right and wrong. He has no reference apart from himself and therefore he becomes the measure of what's good and bad. What a lousy God man makes. God says the alien and you have the same law. People find it hard sometimes to remain a part of this local church. We ain't perfect, but boy, i tell you one thing, we can try our best to obey God's law. And if you got a problem with that, I got two words for you. Leave now. <laughs> because we cannot adjust God's law to suit you because there's plenty of you doing something. Majority doesn't rule in God's kingdom. God rules. Say amen. Read verse 16 aloud. The same laws and regulations will apply to both you and to the alien living among you. Arrest my case. Arrest my case. The way you destroy a community is to have people among you who don't agree with your laws. You don't need to attack a country from outside. Just get people to live among you and let them multiply and have children and they live according to another standard they will become a cancer to the community. And when you wake up one morning, just like Pharaoh said, there will be more of them than us. Hmm? This is why it's important for governments to be aware of any counterculture developing in the country and break it up. Because if they don't break it up, it takes root and becomes another country. Sometimes people would hear governments take bulldozers and go into a place and flatten the whole community and everyone gets angry. But you don't understand, depends on how powerful that community was. 
God says, I will not tolerate any aliens with an alien law in my kingdom community. This is why God searches you out. God is saying, okay, if you are doing things that are ungodly, you are breaking God's law, the Holy Spirit will tell you privately, fix this quickly before I tell everybody. He's trying to protect not just you, but the community. Are you following me? Are you following this? All right, look at this real quickly. Kingdom law and kingdom life, I got a picture here of Charleston Heston. You can't see it too well. One of the greatest movies I ever saw in my life, and perhaps you saw it also, was The Ten Commandments. I still think that he must have visited Moses because he acted that so perfectly that today there's not been a movie made since depicting God delivering those people from slavery. Charleston Heston acted as Moses. And one of the things I noticed is that they showed him in the photographs always with this big plate of stone, this, this double plate, which is the law of God. And I wanted to write this on your heart. Number one, the purpose of God was to extend his heavenly kingdom to earth. And that leads to my second point. A kingdom is a country, a community, like a nation. And therefore, all nations are built on what? Law. This is why we call the powerful foundation of a nation the rule of law. Everybody say rule of law. The prime minister is not a ruler. The, the law is the ruler. The deputy prime minister of the, your country or vice president is not the ruler. They are subject to the other ruler, which is the law. The senator is not the ruler of a country. The congressman and member of parliament is not a ruler. These are all subjects. No one is supposed to be higher than the law. Nations are built on law. And so the first thing God gave Adam was law. And notice, God gave Adam, it's interesting, God gave Adam a strange combination. Oh, please don't miss this. He gave him freedom. You are free to eat, he says. Now that part we like. But then he suddenly said, however, but. <laughs> now the law kicking in. See, privileges without principles is tyranny. Is that too deep for you? In other words, promises without law is chaos. You tell the kids, you hungry, you can eat anything in the kitchen. Okay, that's fine. But clean up when you're finished. Uh-oh. Now you see where you're going, mom. You're messing with the whole thing. We ain't into clean up no dishes. We just want to eat. Now the freedom is to eat anything you want. But the law is when you're finished. You got to clean up. See, freedom without law is chaos. God says, Adam, you can eat from any tree in the garden. But the day you touch that one, kicks in a law, you shall surely die. And when God wanted to create a nation, the first thing God gave Moses was law. God took a group of slaves out of Egypt told Moses, I will build me a royal priesthood and a holy nation. In other words, the goal of God is not to build a religion. Israel was never to become a religion. Judaism is foreign to God. He don't know what they're doing because that was never his plan. His plan was to build a country, a nation. And he knew if I'm going to build a nation, the first thing I need is law. So when they came out of Egypt, Moses brought them to the, to the wilderness. They stood there in that hot place, and Moses says, I'll be right back. Now, let me just say something important here. 
God never intended for Moses to give them the law. Those of you who read the Bible know this. God told Moses to bring all of them to the mountain. He wanted his laws to be written on everybody's mind. In other words, God wanted to cancel lawyers. <laughs> you don't need no one to, un to explain the law to you. I want to tell you this directly. Stop stealing. But the Bible says when they washed their clothes and they came to the mountain and they all stood there waiting, it says the, suddenly when the presence of God began to come down to talk to all the people, the quakes began to start, the rocks began to fall, the lightning and thunder started, and the whole mountain began to shake. And the Bible says the people fled. And while they were running, they said, Moses, you talk to him. And they took off, and they ran away, and they ran to their tents and zipped them up, zip, and they were shaking in their boots because the power of God was coming down. He was coming to talk to everybody. What does this mean? God doesn't want Pastor Miles to be your teacher. He doesn't. He wants the Holy Spirit to teach you by yourself every day to keep the law. He wants to talk to you himself. He wants you to have your personal private government on the inside. Self-governance is by the Holy Spirit. And so what does God do? The Bible says the Lord, when he came down, he found only Moses there. And the Lord God said unto Moses, where are the people? And Moses says, they heard your voice, they saw the thunder, and they fled. And the Lord said unto Moses, then come thou up, and I will give it to you. And that's how Moses got up in that mountain by himself for 40 days. When he came down, he had 10 laws and today those laws are still being used by every country every country every country is still using those laws i'm talking about atheists buddhists hindus muslims everyone still using moses stuff they are still saying thou shall not steal thou shall not bear false witness thou shall not god before me thou shall not commit adultery thou shall not. in other words the laws are so true that even those who hate God got to obey them. No country can be built without the laws God gave Moses. They want God's laws, but they don't want God. And only God can help you keep his laws. And so, the first thing God gave Moses was law. Write this down. Law produce, preserve, and protect a nation. When a nation begins to turn its back on laws, that nation begins to disintegrate and die. The Bahamas and many countries in the Caribbean are under threat right now. And it's all because of disobedience to law. A nation, therefore, without law is chaos. I rest my case with you today that if you get this right, you'll have order in your life all the time. If you get this wrong, you'll have chaos and confusion all the time. You will never progress in your life. You keep going in circles, coming back to the same spot you've been for the last 20 years because when you violate God's law, there's no movement forward. He keeps bringing you back until you get it right. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest challenge of our nation is lawlessness. Lawlessness. I'm not just talking about some of the laws you're thinking about. I'm talking about simple laws, you know, spiritual laws as well. We are lawless and we need to get back to law. I just returned from speaking at Morris Cirillo's conference a couple of days ago in Orlando. They had about 7,000 people there or more, I don't know. And I spoke on this subject. I introduced my subject to them, and the place exploded. When I finished speaking, there was weeping in through the place. 
Dr. Mauro Cirillo came over to me as I walked off the stage. I presented him back the mic. He grabbed me and hugged me. And he said, this is the greatest message I've ever heard. You must teach this everywhere. We must get back to law. Why is there so much corruption in the church? Because people violate law. I thought this would be good. Our goal is to rediscover, write this down please, this is our goal for the year, to rediscover, understand, learn, and apply the principles and laws of heaven on earth. What's our goal? To rediscover, that means we lost them. <laughs> Then we got to what? Understand them. That means we got to explain them. And then we have to apply them. Learn them and apply them. Learn means I got to remember them. And then apply them means I have to practice them. And we have to do them so we can experience kingdom living. God is not going to bless you because you pray. He's going to bless you because you obey. I'm going to repeat this again. God, during this time, this year, he ain't blessing you because you pray and fast. He gonna bless you because you obey his law. Getting by on favor ain't gonna work no more. You gotta line up with law. Obedience to God. The Bible says it's more better to obey God than to worship him. Saul says, I'm going to keep these sheep so I can use them to worship God. Because it's not worship I wanted. I want obedience. And I told you to kill those sheep. He said, I, I, I kept the best for you, Lord. Because you don't understand. Obedience is better than offering sacrifices. How well do you sing? Okay, that's fine. But how are you living? See, your song is your sacrifice. Your life is your obedience. I believe the reason why people love to wear robes in, the, in religion is because it's a good place to hide. And I say this with sadness. Because the minute, the minute we see somebody in a robe, we think that they must be holy. We must return to what? Law and order. Tell your neighbor, law and order. Law. Say it again. Tell your neighbor, law and order. Law. Here's why. Because crisis and chaos is the absence of law and order. Simple. The world is in crisis right now. Simple reason. Wherever there's an absence of law and order, there will always be chaos and confusion. So to solve chaos and confusion, you must return to law and order. This is our assignment this year. I have been working hard, peeling every page of scripture, deciphering, simplifying, so I can serve you the laws of God what we saw here today is obedience to a law not our preference we prefer not to go through this but we are under law you said I got five minutes thank you very much Write this down, please. This is the most important thing I'm going to say today. My heart hurts when I say this. My heart is heavy. The greatest failure in the global church, including our country, I figured it out. Took me 50 years to figure it out. The greatest failure 
in the church. Is lawlessness. Lawlessness. That's what we are suffering from. Number two, the greatest failure in the church is we have made grace more important than law. Please write this down. This is your mark for the rest of the year. That's our problem. You know, we need to, we, we need to sing. I want you to write a new song, you, you songwriters. Here's a song to write. Amazing law. Because we have become so infested with this grace thing that it is destroying us. Grace was supposed to give us life. And grace is destroying us. What do I mean? Look at number three. We have canceled law for grace. We say often, I am no longer under law. Well, it depends on what you mean by law. We can deal with that in the next couple of weeks as we teach this. Because there are two types of law, see? There's ceremonial law, that was religious law in the Bible. Then there was the law of God that never changes. So when Paul says, we are no longer under law, he wasn't talking about the law of God. He's talking about them laws that them Judaizers created. You are never out from under God's law. Never. We have replaced law with grace. Matter of fact, number four is very frightening. We have made law opposed to grace. We've said you are either law or grace. And that law is the enemy of grace. Where did we get this idea from? That's like saying, I don't need to stop the red lights anymore. Why? Because the last time I went to the court, the, the judge says that he gave me mercy. That's, what the, that's exactly what you're telling God. I got mercy once so I can go back out and break every law because I'm covered. No. But that's what we do. Number five. We have made law the enemy of grace. Now think about these things. These are the thoughts we have. And these thoughts are in the church. I'm talking about deep in the church all over the world. They are in the Bahamian church, Jamaican church, Haitian church, Barbadian church, the South American church, the Central American, the United States. Oh my God, they are deep. They are in the European church. This is in the church. It's in this church. We got this idea. I'm under grace. And we made the law the enemy. Number six, we have used grace to disobey law. But God will forgive me so I can do this. You ever said that? Don't answer that question. I know I shouldn't do this. I know I shouldn't do this, but boy, this feels good right now. So I can do this, and then after I finish, I go home and read my Bible, ask God to forgive me. You are using grace to disobey God's law. And then you have the audacity to go before God and say, prosper me. And God is trying to figure out, are you an alien? You must be an illegal immigrant trying to get pension. Pension is for citizens who qualify. You see how quiet it is right now? It's going to be that way all year. Because we need to get spanked by God. Slapped in the face. God need to tell us, I'm sick of it. That's enough. Stop it, he says. 
Don't ask me to bless you in the gall of disobedience. We've made grace license to obey, to disobey God's law. Matter of fact, let's just say it, write this down. We have used the grace of God as license to break the law of God. You know, God has blessed me personally. He's blessed my family. And I don't talk a lot about my own blessings because I've found out lately that when you talk about it, people think all kinds of things about you. So I keep my blessings private now. And then they think you're also teething. So, you know. So, but I'm telling you, Nothing in my life happened because of some trick or favor. It's because of obedience. I made a decision years ago, God, I'm going to obey you even if it hurts me. If it kills me, I'm going to, I'm going to obey you. Temptation is simply an invitation to disobey the law of God. And boy, am I tempted daily. But I have to, the same way you are tempted to go beyond the speed limit, especially between Miami and Orlando. Don't look now, but there's a guilty one right behind you. There's a temptation on the back road of Florida where there is no party, man. Lord, have mercy on my foot. <laughs> there is this... <laughs> and the only way to not violate that law, ain't nobody watching you, you know, is your heart. What do you do when no one is watching? Hey, boy, said license. So here's my conclusion Grace gives you freedom. To keep the law. Say that with me. Grace gives you freedom, okay, to keep the law. Okay. Got it? Everybody got that? Grace gives you what? Freedom. The judge lets you go free, but you don't go there and run the red light. God says, I forgive you. Woman caught in adultery. Next statement. Go and sin no more. That's the law. I forgive you. That's the grace. Go and sin no more. That's the law. You got caught. Good. Forgiven? Don't do it again. That's the kingdom of God. <laughs> These lawyers will tell you, when a judge gives you mercy, he will always end it with this statement. Don't let me see you in my courtroom again. Am I right? Lawyer? Yeah, he tell you. Do you know why the lawyer, lawyer said, I'm giving you freedom. That's grace. But I'm giving you to keep the law. Don't come back here. Freedom without law is anarchy. Chaos. That's why God will never give you freedom without law. You know, I said a lot of statements. Let's just read some scripture. Galatians 5, 13. Write it down. Read it with me. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Read. You, my brothers, were called to be free. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah, free. Hallelujah. Read the next verse. But do not use your freedom. Do not use your freedom, he says, to indulge in sinful nature. Rather, use it to serve one another in love. Wow. He said, look, God forgave you not to go and sin. Verse 14. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Not going around committing these different things. The law is you keep God's law of love. Respect, honor one another. In other words, you don't use the freedom to go and experiment to see if you can't get caught. Do you know something? I want to give you some advice. Because most people are stressed out and sick because of private sin. Private sin is a lot of stress. 
I mean, do you know there's a bee sitting here right now? Listen to me and in private sin. I know you're stressed out right now. I mean, listen, your blood pressure, listen, this is serious. It is such a burden to be in sin. That's why your growths start. You get tumors because the body's under stress from sin. And let me tell you why God tells you to confess your sin. If you carry it, it's like a pressure cooker. It builds up and builds up until it explodes in some area of your life. It may be a tumor. It may be bone cancer. It may be all kind of stuff. But it will explode. But when you confess it, it's like taking the cap off a pressure cooker. Psst. Oh, it feels so good. The happiest man in this room is Pastor Alan Monroe today. Do you know why? The pressure is off. Oh, thank you, God. It's out. Amen. What about your weight? You sitting here with your wife today and you know you ain't living right with your wife and secret stuff going on and you got to go back home and remember what Pastor Allen did today. That's a weight. Freedom not to indulge. First Peter chapter 2 verse 16. Let's read together. Are you ready? Go. Live as free men. Say, praise the Lord. Yeah, we like that freedom. Praise the Lord. Next verse. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. This is in the Bible, man. Can I say it plainer? He set me free. Yeah, he set me free. Good. Don't use it as a cover. Everybody say law and order in the house. God bringing it back to his house. And believe me, God ain't taking no prisoners. The Lord, let me tell you what, when the Lord tells you things as heavy as this, that's killing time. I'm telling you, dying, God is going to kill people. I know I can get all mixed up on that. I know you can cope in all kinds of tell me all kinds of stuff. I say, okay, I know. Please don't write me any letters, okay? But listen, God had it. No, the, the Bible normally says the Lord has endured your sins for a long time. Then it says it has come up to his nostrils. In other words, God getting ready to drown and he ain't going to drown. This is law and order year. This is judgment year. If you don't want to get caught, don't get catch. Did I come out right? <laughs> in other words, if you don't want to want to know what you're doing, don't do it. No. Read the next statement again. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. I rest my case. This is our challenge. Jude. The last book before Revelation says, out loud, read, they are godless men who change the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ as the only sovereign Lord. That's in your Bible. Read it again. They are godless. That means they got less God in them. <laughs> they are godless. How? Because they change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny that Jesus Christ rules their lives as Lord and King. Now Jesus said, you call me Lord, but you don't do what I say. That was his famous statement. You call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say. Lordship shows up in obedience let's pray time is gone father we repent I repent any law that I may have broken in your kingdom forgive me Lord I'm so sorry if I have violated your regulations forgive me Lord for even thinking evil lustful thoughts Lord deliver me from 
intentions that are not right, even in business. Father, forgive me. Cleanse me, O oh Lord. Search me. I repent. Have mercy upon me, Lord. I've seen you, Pastor. Let me live a life that is worthy of being trusted. I give my life to you again, Lord, as your servant. I want to be a servant of God. May I never use your grace to do evil. May I never use your grace as license to be immoral. All those watching this program around the world live, Lord, speak to them. Those listening on radio, speak to them. Let us all line up in this auditorium with your Lord again. I give you thanks, Lord. I give you thanks. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.